this proved appealing. I thought, great, no tryouts? They can't tell me I can't come. And I just started going. And that is the beginning of the story that Rabbi Rosenblum will tell us about tonight, her journey from growing up in Teaneck, New Jersey, my hometown, to Brandeis, five minutes where I live now, to archery in the Maccabee Games, to becoming a pulpit conservative rabbi in Florida. So Rabbi Rosenblum, take it away. Thank you so much. It's uh, my pleasure to be here tonight. You guys can all hear me okay? Yes, no, thumbs up. I know yeah, you're all yes, muted, yes. so you can't really yeah, say I anything. Yeah, we can. Yes, yes we can. Great. Awesome. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here. For anyone who knows me knows that I am a kind of last minute person. So if at the end of my slideshow, we run out of the photos I wanted to show you, I'll apologize and we can uh, hopefully get to some of them afterwards. But um, I'll begin by... Well, I want to say, if you guys have any questions, put them into the chat, please. And we'll, uh, Rabbi Rosenblum will either uh, address them immediately or we'll do that afterwards. So all the questions into chat, thanks. Okay, so I am going to share my screen. We'll see if this does what it's supposed to do or not. Hopefully I can find the right one. It's like always the fun part of the presentation when you want to show what you're doing. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see this by now. We will, of course, now I took it out of the wrong one. One more time. Give me one second. Okay. One more time from the beginning. Here we go. So as Danny said, um, I am Rabbi Shira Rosenblum. This is my presentation of from Brandeis to the Maccabiya to the pulpit. And while this is the image you would have expected to see from pulpit, um, this is the one that I actually want to show you because that is the backyard of my synagogue. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have archery in the backyard of your synagogue. Uh, I can only see a few of your faces, so I will not take my cues from whether or not you're appreciating what I have to say. Um, but I'm pretty excited that this is finally a, a dream come true that I'm able to practice where I work. Um, and we'll get to kind of how I got there in a minute. So this is a question I get a lot, right? Rabbi, how did you first get into archery? As um, Danny just explained, I tried to do a couple other things. I was in college and I thought I would do some other clubs and it just didn't happen. So I joined the archery club at Brandeis, a club that I still support to this day, a club that I, you know, is very near and dear to my heart. I went to competitions. I was able to convince the rest of the team that we should shoot on Sundays. And the rest of them said, sure, we don't care. I said, great, because the choices are Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, and I would like to go on Sunday. And they all said, sure, no problem. We're happy to go along with it. And that was sort of the first victory I had on my way to being able to compete uh, on this kind of level. Uh, we had a wonderful coach. Um, I'll show you on the next slide some of the team shots from the competitions we went to. Um, here at the bottom of the screen, this is our coach. He was great. Um, the guy right next to him had known him growing up and had recommended to Brandeis that they hire him to be our archery coach. The club had equipment you could use, but it was pretty basic. Um, there's a woman you can see over here. Um, her name was Sonia, and she was actually had been doing competitive archery way before she got to Brandeis. And she had just bought herself some new equipment. So when she donated her old equipment to the club, my coach said, oh, you and Sonia, you're probably about the same height, you know, She's a small Asian woman, you're a small Jewish woman, you are the same build, nobody else in our club has anything to do with what you guys look like. You can use Sonia's old equipment. But Sonia's old equipment was light years better than any of the equipment the club had. And so from a kind of early stage, I was really lucky that I was able to use nicer equipment than I would have normally in a college setting. Um, 
one of the things that we did during practice one day is our coach said, okay, as ready as a challenge, we're going to put up a ping pong ball. We're going to suspend it from a string and we're going to hang it on the back of an arrow. So it'll be suspended hanging in midair off of a target. We'll be standing 18 meters, which is standard indoor distance. It's about 56, 57 feet or so away from the target. And we want you to take turns. Everybody's going to have a turn one arrow at a time. So the first person would shoot, the next person would shoot, the next person would shoot, trying to see who could hit the ping pong ball. One of our friends from the team drew a moose on the ping pong ball. And I will show you that moose because I'm the one who hit it. And I was then allowed to keep the, the ping pong ball with a moose on his face. So my arrow went right through it. It's one of the most gratifying sounds and feelings I probably have almost ever had. Um, you never think you can hit something that small. And then you do. Um, throughout college, I went to competitions. I would say indoor season runs about October through February or March, which is great because for someone who is an observant Jew, by October, most of the, often the holidays are finished and you don't really have so many major holidays that come up again until after February, March. So most of the season I could go to compete every couple of weeks. There would be competitions in Massachusetts, in Connecticut, in Rhode Island, various states that we could drive to. Uh, I became the club secretary. I ended up becoming one of the campus, you know, athletic van drivers. We went for a little certification class with the campus police. They showed us a video. They said, if you don't know the answers to the question on the test after watching the video, ask the person next to you. And I said, if I don't know the answer to the question on the test, you're gonna let me drive your van? That doesn't sound like a good idea, but that's what they said. So I started driving the vans to get to the competitions that we would go to and we would go on Sundays. Like I said, I really got lucky that the people were agreeable to that. Um, that kind of made the whole thing possible for me. Um, I did end up earning several medals. I was shooting in the collegiate division, which is much smaller than the division I'm in now, which is the senior division. Senior division is sort of 18 to 50. Uh, collegiate is really just those college years. Um, and the more you show up, the more you earn points towards your ranking. And so by the end of my college career, I had been ranked second in the state of Massachusetts for two years in a row for female, what's called Olympic recurve division, which is the division that I was shooting. Now I got to the end of, oh, one more thing that I thought was kind of funny. So anyone who's familiar with Brandeis, knows that we have uh, Ollie the Owl was our mascot. You can see him here. This was the archery version of Ollie the Owl. He's a cartoon owl. He's very fun loving and sweet. But at some point during my career, the college decided that the owl was not fierce enough to be the mascot. And they said, we're gonna be coming up with a new mascot. Everybody's gonna have to wait. And we'll let you know when we have a decision. And our coach said, well, that's all well and good but we're gonna be going to competitions and we need to look like a team. So we're gonna make our own mascot. And one of the guys, that same guy who had drawn the moose on the ping pong ball, he was into um, computer science and into comic writing and coloring. And he literally sketched on the whiteboard, a fierce looking owl. And our coach said, could you, could you draw that again? And let's you know, work on it and workshop it. And we're gonna make Onyx instead of Ollie. So we have Onyx. I became our fierce mascot, six pack and talons of an owl with uh, that sharp beak and the very pensive eyes focusing on an actually accurate what the bow should look like. Um, and we put that on the back of our jerseys. This became our mascot for the backs of t-shirts, for the fronts of shirts, swag for ourselves. And um, the best part is when it's on your back and you're shooting next to somebody else on the shooting line, if they're the same um, hand as you are, um, which is actually an interesting thing that I haven't explained yet, but we'll get there, um, then it serves to be a little intimidating. Now, after the question of Rabbi, how did you get into archery? One of the next questions I usually get is, when did you start thinking about a connection between Judaism and archery? Because those are two things that have been important to me for a long time. And I have for many years now put the two together. Um, so starting when I worked at Camp Ramad Darom, uh, the one that's down here in Clayton, Georgia, uh, I was here for about five summers before I had started doing archery 
so much at school. My fourth summer, I had started doing archery, but they had someone for that summer, so I continued doing my other jobs. But by my last summer on staff, they said, we'd like you to be our archery instructor. And so that summer, I just got my feet wet in actually teaching. I hadn't really taught it to a group of people before. Um, I added in a few Hebrew words here and there, maybe one or two ideas from Judaism that might fit with archery. Um, but I hadn't really thought much further than that. Uh, a few summers later, um, I was about to start rabbinical school. I had really stayed involved in archery after graduating from college, but you remember I told you that I had been able to use that equipment that had been donated by my other teammate. When I graduated, all of that equipment had to stay with the club. So I joined a local range um, near my parents in Queens where they had just moved. And I went there and I bought my own equipment from them and started going to a league there and was able to go to practice some of the time Competitions were not so easy to get to when I was living in New York. There was a couple, but not as many as there had been up in um, New England. And I did it kind of for fun. And I mostly focused on teaching it at summer camp. And when I was about to start rabbinical school, I was approached by the director at Ramah in the Rockies, the Ramah Outdoor Adventure, one of the newer Ramah camps at the time, back in 2012. And he said, I met your mom at an educational conference and I heard that you do archery. We really need an archer to take our program to the next level. We got started last year, but our archer can't come back. We have a few targets, but we have tons of space. And I want you to tell us what targets to buy and tell us what equipment you want. And basically I want you to build a program from almost nothing. And that's what I did. Um, it was a great opportunity to try something new. I ran that program with two other archery instructors for that first summer I was out at Ramon the Rockies. And I went back for two more years to run their archery program. Each summer I was there, I probably trained at least one new archery instructor to work with me. Someone would show up to camp, supposed to be a uh, horse truck back riding instructor, or they were supposed to work with X you know, age group. And all of a sudden they expressed an interest in archery and camp said, great, sure, you'll certify them. They'll start working with you. It's fine. You'll, you'll train them. They'll be on your team. And that's how we kind of grew the staff at archery at Vermont and the Rockies. We made a regular range with straight targets. We made an advanced range. I couldn't find that photo, but really the advanced range was sort of one of the awesome things we put in there. We had a target that was an 18-sided cube. We hung between two trees, called it the hanging target. And we had targets at different distances and kids really could get a sense for trying to figure out how to aim when they were aiming in different places. But the best part of being there was I wrote a curriculum for teaching Jewish values through archery. Um, I spent those couple summers really taking not the obvious connections, right? Everybody can tell you right around Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, right? We're gonna talk about missing the mark and, and chet, right? And chet and all of the things that people think of when they think of archery. Or they were going to tell me about David and Yonatan, right? David and Jonathan and the story from the Tanakh of shooting his arrows to tell David whether or not his father, King Saul was looking after him or whether it was safe to come back. And I knew those stories and I figured I would maybe use them later, but I wanted to start off with some of the not so obvious connections. Um, I'm gonna actually stop my share for a minute because I don't have any pictures for this part, but I figured I would tell you a couple of the things that I have done with this curriculum before we move on to the rest of the pictures. Um, so let's say that we are on our first day of archery class and I'm showing you how to be safe with your arrows and I tell you, you know, the arrows are sharp, you're gonna shoot them into the target and they're gonna make a hole and you can't really take that hole back. What else in our lives is sort of like that, right? You send something out into the world and you hope that it goes where you want it to go, but you can't really affect, once you've let something go into the world, where it's gonna land and who it's gonna impact. And for me, that was really a connection for the idea of Lashon Hara, of guarding your speech or of being careful with how you speak, right? The words that you say go out into the world, like that story with the feather in the pillow and everybody is trying to gather all the feathers back up. The same with archery. You can't, you know, mend the holes in the target that you've just got. Um, another one of the lessons that I have taught includes the um, a midrash from 
um, a comment from Ramban, the Nachmanides, who talked about the rainbow in the sky. And Nachmanides wrote that the rainbow after the flood, right, we think of the rainbow in the sky that sort of is, looks like a bow. The word for rainbow is the same as the word for bow in bow and arrow. And we always may wonder why was the rainbow given as a sign for peace? However, the rainbow, you know, shoots up towards the sky. If you're thinking of it as a bow, the arrows are pointing towards the sky. And Nachmanides, right, Ramban said, that was the way that the ancient Greeks practiced uh, their warfare. If they were trying to approach someone coming with, you know, with peace, they didn't, they wanted to let their enemies know that they were approaching without wanting to engage in warfare. They would hold their bow inverted, basically pointed towards themselves. Um, and by walking into battle with your bow pointing towards yourself, you're showing your enemy that there's no possible way that you're going to shoot at them because you can't, right? You're, you've now pointed your weapon at yourself. And the comment from Nachmanides was that that was the way that the ancient Greeks entered war. And that's what God was showing us, that God was pointing his weapons away from earth as a way to show that God was not going to destroy the world because you can't shoot down on the earth with a rainbow that's pointed towards the sky. So that's only two of several lessons that I've included. If at the end people want to hear a few more, I'm happy to continue. But for now, we'll go back to uh, the first place that I shared some of those um, lessons was actually at a um, archery training that the National Ramah Commission put together for camp counselors from both Ramah and URJ, the reform movement um, summer camp. In between my first and second summers of going to Ramah and the Rockies, they had me come for a four day training. So this is me training some other instructors so that they could go back to their camp and um, teach archery. And also I gave them some of my content. Over the years, I've now probably trained at least 15 or 20 archery instructors, including 10 for seven different Ramah camps that I trained on Zoom last summer before the summer started. So if you wanna talk about interesting ways of training people, I'm happy to explain it. So before anybody gets uh, too riled up, the, this last picture that just popped up is uh, not a real animal. Uh, animal shaped targets are very popular in what's called 3D archery, which is archery that is shot at targets that look like they could be real animals. Um, the interesting thing about Ramon the Rockies is that they have a different format of how the summer camp program works. They have kids who are in camp for a couple of days and then they go on what they call their masaot or backcountry trips where they would take kids backpacking or climbing or mountain biking, um, horseback riding, all these different you know, outdoor adventure style trips that you could go on and then come back to camp and continue having Shabbat and activities with everybody else. And then you would go back out on a trip and come back. And over the course of two weeks, you'd have been there for a week and you've been out of camp for a week on a trip. And my first summer, they said, great, you're going to be one of the people who stays back in camp to do extra archery with the kids who have shorter trips, right? We're not going to take an archery trip. We'll keep you in camp. You don't need to do wilderness first responder training. You'll just come, you'll do archery stuff for those first couple of days, get the range set up. And when the little kids only have a two day trip, They'll have three other days when they're in camp when all the big kids are out of camp. So they'll do extra archery that week and we'll have you as one of our base camp staff. And that was really great for that first summer. And for the second summer, I got back to camp and they said, you know, we found a local archery range that's at a national park where you can take the kids backpacking. You can backpack from the campsite to where the archery range is and you can do a couple days of um, archery and backpacking trips. And I thought, this is great. We had an advanced class for the seventh and eighth graders who were there for a whole month and they chose to do archery for that whole month. They were the ones who could, you know, earn a, a little medal at the end of the summer. It was, it was written on paper and laminated, so nothing too fancy, but they got excited about it. And um, I took these kids, we had them basically sew up their own quivers. We made them out of an old tablecloth and some, you know, string. Camp is very rustic. We had bows that would break down that you could carry with you in your backpack, um, lightweight arrows that we could take on our trip. And this was one of the times that I was able to kind of take the kids and show them that archery and being outdoors. We talked about, you know, how Judaism and hunting don't really go together. Um, we talked about the prevention of cruelty to animals, you know, some of the values that we could bring in on that trip. 
um, kind of in added value to the way that I was able to share those with my students, my campers. Um, some of the most unlikely places I've ever done archery. So I went to rabbinical school in New York at JTS. I continued shooting out in Queens. It would take me about an hour and a half to take the train from the, you know, up by Columbia where JTS is down all the way out through Brooklyn and out to Queens um, to get to the league at the range that I used to go to. So I didn't really go that often. I would go once in a while and mostly shoot over the summer or maybe at Passover camp at Ramah in Georgia also. Um, but when I went to Israel, I really did not, I didn't bring my equipment. I didn't expect to be shooting. I didn't have extra money to be shooting. You know, these things cost money. Um, and so I, found a, I found a club. She's, she's a champion archer and she's in a rabbi um, in Jacksonville, Florida. Someone is speaking, but I'll just keep going. Um, I found a club and I traded with the guy who ran that club. I said, if I offer some of my time to help basically run your, your range, right? Give tips to the newcomers, show someone how to use the equipment. Can I shoot without joining the club, right? Without paying you a fee to be here. He said, sure, we have some equipment you can borrow for the year. You know, whenever you're here, this can be your setup. So the equipment I'm shooting in this picture here was borrowed. Um, so it wasn't something I was used to, but at least it was close enough. Um, and I actually was able to participate in a competition while I was there. This was my, during my rabbinical school year, we went for a, a weekend and at the end of the like Shabbaton, they dropped me off at the archery competition. And I met up with the archery people from Jerusalem and competed in Ramat Gan and then went back to, um, back to meet up with my friends again after the end of the competition. So that was definitely something I had not expected to be able to do and was great to kind of meld those two things together. Uh, another unlikely place that I have done archery is while I was doing chaplaincy, right? So many rabbinical students do a unit of CPE, of clinical pastoral education. I did that in Colorado. I didn't really want to stop going to camp. So after I was the head of the archery program at Ramon the Rockies for three summers, I said, how can I stay close to Colorado? I ended up doing a semester in Los Angeles as a transfer student. And then I went to Colorado for the summer and found this interesting chaplaincy course with the woman whose arm is around me. She was our um, group leader. She was a minister and she and her husband owned a horse ranch, which is where we are standing in this picture. So we would do some of our CPE classes with the horses, figuring out how to work through our issues by leading horses one way to the other. Promise you no one else has ever had a CPE chaplaincy experience quite like this one. And on the weekends, I would drive up to camp and I would spend my weekends at camp. I would help out in whatever ways that I could, do a little bit of archery here and there, but mostly spend Shabbat with um, whoever I still knew and meeting some new people, helping with leading of services. Most often I would get there and they'd say, oh, we have a Torah reading we couldn't give out. You think you could read this Torah reading? Sure, no problem. Skill of mine, no problem. Another interesting place, um, my fourth year of rabbinical school, I did my internship at the JCC of Manhattan. And the JC of Manhattan is on the Upper West Side. It is not a huge building. It goes, you know, tall, but it's not like there's huge, you know, massive spaces in it. And we figured out a way to do archery with suction cups on a whiteboard during the Tikkun Lel Shavuot at like the 3 a.m. slot. Um, archery and Judaism and a little bit of learning for Shavuot. That was definitely one of the most interesting places I've ever uh, done archery. Another was, um, I don't have a picture because it was on Shabbat, but I went to a uh, USY convention while I was in Los Angeles for the semester. They had a program where rabbinical students could come and kind of be rabbinical student in residence at the USY convention. And I did an archery stock rate for them. Right? We also bought uh, suction cup archery sets and we took the sidur and we found which, you know, tefillah we were going to look at. And then they would have a chance to shoot the bow and arrow after we had talked about the ideas of the Shema and focusing and having the intention that you need to be able to do your stuff. You know, the word lichaven, which means to aim, is related to the word kavana for the focus and intention that we have to have in our tefillot. And for each of the tefillot that we did, I would give them a connection to our church. Um, so you name it, I've probably done it. So the Jewish Journeys Project was a alternative religious school program. 
And they gave me space in a multi-purpose room in the middle of the JCC to literally do archery with New York City kids who would have no other opportunity to do that. And especially not as part of their religious school experience. Um, we put basically these big pieces of plywood against the back wall and you hoped that they protected the wall. You also hoped that they didn't ruin the arrows. Um, but it was really not the size that was conducive to doing this activity. We made it work. Um, and it was a great, great semester of, you know, basically one class that I did for them for their religious school program. Um, and we did. Here's one of the other lessons that I would do. The word for target is a matara or matarot, meaning gold. And if you don't have a target or you don't know what you're shooting towards, you can't possibly have a goal without knowing where you're trying to end up. So we would have the kids make goals for themselves and put them on the target based on what they wanted for themselves in the middle for their family or their community in the Why next can't spring I out. Turn down the volume and on this? for the one further than that, um, for the you know greater Jewish community or even the larger world. Okay. How did I get into the Maccabi games the first time? So four and a half years ago, I um, was approached. This is the, the final part, but I was approached by someone at the Maccabi Games and they said, um, let's pause that share again for a minute. They said to me, we heard from a friend of ours who works at a different camp, who knows your camp director that you do archery and we're looking to have an archer go to Israel. You know, the Maccabi Games back in 2013 was the first time that there was archery as a sport included in the Maccabi Games. And we want to make sure that we have a team. We didn't send anyone in 2013. So for 2017, we want to have a team. And they said to me, are you good enough? If you tell us you're good enough, then we'll let you go. And I said, there's no tryouts. But what do we have to do? Like, I feel like I'm deja vu all over again, right? I didn't have any tryouts back in college and I got into it kind of by accident. And now I want to go to Israel and they're telling me, just tell us whether or not you're good enough. Sure. I'm good enough. Great. I'll, I'll go. Um, and that's what happened. I started practicing um, pretty much every week. Um, that hour and a half train ride I told you about from up at Columbia down through Brooklyn and out to Queens. I would do that about once a week. I went to this uh, range called Proline. I thought they're the same one that's near my, where my parents had lived in Queens, where I was able to practice um, this is what it looks like when you stand about 18 meters away from your targets, they're down there. And this is about how much space you have between you and the person next to you. Um, and I was used to shooting this size target. This is called a 40 centimeter target. This is a target that's used for standard indoor distance. Now I have to share that these are some of my best rounds. It's called an end. Um, not every end did it look like this, but these are the ones I kept. So I can't show you the ones where I missed, but you can see the other holes right there. They're all over the place, but they're hopefully mostly in the center. And the challenge I had to do was for the Maccabi, yeah, I was gonna have to shoot on this target instead. This is called a vertical three spot. It's a target that's used in international competition. And it's also a target that's used um, at what's called the Vegas shoot, which is a very big competition they do in Las Vegas every year. Um, but this target um, is more challenging because you have to shoot in three different places instead of just trying to shoot all of your arrows in the same spot. Now, the only other challenge that goes along with it is that you only get the inner six rings, right? You can't get points for a five, four, three, two, or one. Whereas if you were on the center single spot, you might have been able to get you know, a couple points for the ones that were not quite as close to center as you wanted them to be. So this was my first challenge. This was learning how to use the vertical three spot. Um, People who use three spot targets in this country for the most part are the ones who are breaking all of their arrows when they shoot on a regular one. So they switch so that they can not break their arrows. But I just was switching because I needed to try to get better for that for the Maccabi game. And the other thing I had to work on was outdoors. So what I haven't explained to you is kind of how archery competitions work. So archery competitions work that Indoor season I mentioned was from about October to February or March. And those were about once in a weekend. You'd have 20 ends. I mentioned an end is a round, right? An end is three arrows for an indoor competition. And what you do is you shoot your best score out of 600. 
And you can shoot Friday night, you can shoot Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, or Sunday afternoon. Just have to take one of those five time slots and you can shoot and then the scores were tallied up against each other and whoever won at the end would get a medal on Sunday. Now, when I went to what was called Indoor Nationals, it's actually a competition that I was just at two days ago. Um, the one that they just had for this year was two days ago out in uh, near Gainesville, where it's not so far from where I live in Newberry, Florida. And it's a two day competition, which means you have to shoot Friday and Saturday or Saturday and Sunday. But we all know that I can't shoot on both of those days. So back in college, I got permission to shoot on Sunday at nine with everybody who had shot on Saturday at nine. And then they'd gone home and taken a shower and had some food and gotten some rest. And then they came back all nice and fresh. I would shoot with them on Sunday morning at nine. And then I would shoot again at one o'clock. Mind you, we started at nine. We probably finished around 1230, which means that for about half an hour, I could have a break. I could have lunch. I could go to the bathroom, I could stretch, and I could get back to it. And by one o'clock, when I start the next part of the tournament, everybody who's shooting with me has taken the day off since yesterday. They might have shot at one o'clock on Saturday, maybe they shot at five o'clock on Saturday, uh, and then they went home and had dinner, took a shower, went to sleep. Um, so indoor nationals has never been my event. It's always been something that I struggled with because I'm shooting double the amount of arrows. I'm shooting about 144 arrows in one day, um, whereas a normal tournament is 72. Um, and if you're if you're lucky, when you go to practice, you might have time to shoot 90 to 100 arrows, but most people don't shoot more than that. Um, so my coach used to call me Super Sierra, and my friends, we all got into it. One day they gave me a cape because Indoor Nationals fell on Purim. So I put the cape on and the judges said I had to take it off. So Super Sierra was a, an internal mindset, but not a external caped person. Um, outdoor season. And that's why I mentioned all of this. Outdoor season, you don't have the option to do two in one day. Outdoor season works that you have to shoot two days of qualifying rounds and a third day of elimination rounds. And so most often it's Friday and Saturday are the qualifiers and Sunday are the elimination rounds. So I never did outdoor season. I can count on one hand the number of times I had shot at outdoor distance, which is 70 meters, which we're not going to be able to tell, but this target is called 122 centimeter target. It is much, much bigger, but from really far away, right from about 220 feet away, which is about 70 meters, it's about almost three quarters of your football field. It looks as small as the 40 centimeter target when you're looking at it from that far away. And so I probably got to 70 meters maximum four or five times in all of the you know last month or so leading up to going to Israel. Because when I was living in New York, there are only so many months where it's warm enough to go do outdoor practice. And so I only got out there a couple of times. Sometimes I would drive out there. It was out on Long Island. And I would sometimes take the subway back to the Queens to get my parents' car to drive to Long Island. And by the time I got there, it was raining. So I really didn't have so much luck with outdoor season and practice. But I figured in Israel, those are the two distances you can do. And you do two days at 18 meters, two days at 70 meters. And I said, I'm going all the way to Israel for three weeks. I'm going to do both parts of the competition. So here we go. In Israel, the first week of the Maccabi Games is what they call Israel Connect. Um, the US delegation, which was over 1,100 people uh, between athletes, coaches, trainers, doctors, et cetera, they take you on their version of birthright. They want to make sure that everyone who's going gets to see the Kotel, gets to see um, various different sites. They had a group B'nai Mitzvah program. This was part of the swarm of us on our way into opening ceremonies. Um, I didn't have a better picture available, but there's tons online if you just Google the US delegation. Um, there's actually one on my website. That's the first week. And then the next two weeks, they have the competition. So the next two weeks, we had our competition. This was me holding the US flag. They needed one person from each uh, country to hold their flag. Uh, I was the only one from my country. So this is my, me holding the flag. Um, there were nine countries, whereas there had only been five countries uh, back in 2013. But four of the nine countries only brought one athlete, just like me. Um, I went as the only one from the US and there were athletes from Spain and France, the Ukraine, um, the Czech Republic, Australia, Israel, um, Argentina, Mexico. Those are the kind of countries who showed up. Um, this is what it looked like when you shot to the 18 meters away. They put four of those vertical three spots onto one uh, 
big target structure. These were some of my better rounds, but you can see the ones that didn't quite go in the center as I wanted them to, but pretty good. By the time I got to Israel, I was shooting better than I had ever shot in college, even though I had, you know, one medal back in school and had been ranked. Uh, my parents and my grandmother um, came with me. They showed up. They didn't come for that first week, but they came for those other two weeks to come to my competition. We got to see some of our family. It was a really great experience. Um, one of the most interesting things is that before I went to Israel, I bought new arrows. These are called outdoor arrows. They're nice and thin and aerodynamic to get all the way down to 70 meters. I bought red, white, and blue, right? I thought that was so clever. And um, these are called veins. The, what looks like a, it should be a feather, but it's actually a little bit of a rubber, um, it's called a rubber vein. And that's what helps your arrow fly straight. But after a couple of days in the heat and the humidity of Israel, this is what my arrows look like. I don't know if you can see that, but they are wavy and curved and warped from the heat. So these were no longer flying straight. And one of the Israeli archers, this man named Natan, who I literally had just met like a day before, it was probably the Thursday or Friday before the competition was going to start the following Sunday. He said to me, you can't shoot these arrows. They're obviously not flying straight. The heat and humidity in Israel has not been kind to your arrows. Um, let me take them home over the weekend and put on new, uh, what are called fletching. Um, they're a lighter weight plastic. -y. They sort of look like hard plastic cellophane. Um, I didn't have a good picture of those either, but we'll see if I get to it later. Um, and he took all my arrows home. All I had to pay for was the actual material he was gonna put on. One of the other archers from another country had an extra set. And he took them home and he put them on for me and I was able to compete in the competition, but I would not have been able to shoot the rest of that week if I hadn't had the kindness of another fellow archer. Um, he had no reason to help me other than archers are nice people like that. It's a real community. There's actually a Facebook group, Jewish Archers of the World Unite, Jawu, um, which I didn't know about until I got excited for the Bukabi games, but people on there send posts to each other. They send Shabbat Shalom with pictures of flowers. And um, it's just, it's an interesting dynamic. These were some of the women from the other countries who I was there with. And this last photo here is the whole group of all the archers from all the different countries. You can see the different colors were the different um, uniforms. Um, and that was the group of us who were there on the last day of the competition. Um, now, this I took a few weeks ago. This is all of the medals that I have won since I started doing archery. Only one of them, this one, is the one I got last month at the Florida State Championship. Only one, that's the only one that I have since being part of the senior division, right? I mentioned earlier, senior division is 18 to 50. Uh, it's really hard to do well in a division that's 18 to 50. Um, collegiate division was much easier, right? All these medals, maybe there was a couple people who were against me not so many. Um, I still enjoy and cherish having them, but that one that I got last month made a little bit more um, now that I was in, you know, the big games, it feels like. Um, last year at Indoor Nationals, and now these are the pictures that I didn't get a chance to put where I wanted them. But let me pull them up just in a folder for a minute and I will show you anyway. Um, last year at Indoor Nationals, I really wanted to find a coach. I hadn't had a coach since college and I figured it was time to really get back into it. I knew the Maccabi games were around the corner. They were supposed to have been last summer, but with COVID they actually got pushed um, because the Olympics moved. Um, and so I decided I would get back into it. You know, I've been a rabbi for the last four and a half years. Basically two weeks after I got back from Israel, I moved to Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and I decided that I wasn't going to put archery in, in our 34 acre campus right away, because that would be the only thing people knew about me when I first showed up. Um, but this past year I did put archery in and that's what I mentioned earlier. I'll show you those in a minute. Um, but basically I was able to put archery in in the back and have been training for um, the last, year or so with a coach that I met because of somebody I met at Indoor Nationals last year. Um, I was down in Gainesville. I was lamenting to the people there that there's no one in my part of Florida who really does um, the kind of archery that I do, um, the Olympic style of archery. Most um, 
part people in this part of Florida do bow hunting, or maybe they um, do what's called traditional archery, but the kind of bow that I have uh, is too fancy for them. And it's uh, got too many bells and whistles. So I will show you that right now. Um, this was last year. I was not even sure I was going to be able to go, but because um, they were able to figure out a way to make that happen, I was pleased to be able to do that. Um, so that's this photo. This was me at Indoor Nationals last year. Um, this is what it looks like at the place that I go in Newberry. Um, there is one of me with my best end, right? I told you an end is uh, three, three arrows. Let's find where the arrows are. They're over there in the target. Very nice. Um, and they said, have you heard of Coach Mike? Coach Mike moved from Colorado to Daytona, probably not that far from you. So I looked on the map, Daytona is about an hour and 15, but relatively an hour and 15 isn't so bad. So now I go every week on my day off to see Coach Mike. Um, he is wonderful. He's one of the top level coaches in the whole country. Um, and he meets with me on my day off and he actually just came to the competition that I was at. Um, and he had three other archers who were there too. And he's helping me train for the Maccabi game. Um, the, all of my recent practice photos are at his house um, in his, you know, basically on his driveway from his garage out to the driveway where he puts a target um, is where we practice now. Um, and if not there, then I'm practicing at my synagogue. Um, you know, this, I told you the outdoor season is not really a thing. Um, however, this past August, I did get to go to um, what's called Outdoor Nationals. Instead of being Friday, Saturday with um, Sunday qualifiers, they moved it and they put it on Thursday, Friday with Saturday elimination rounds. And so we decided I would do the Thursday, Friday and I would skip the Saturday part. And while I was there, I actually got to shoot next to the most recent, uh, one of the most recent Olympians who had been in Tokyo just a month earlier. Um, and that was really a very cool experience. He found out that I was a rabbi and that whole day he kept asking me all these questions about what, you know, various different things that it means to be Jewish, how we observe different meets vote, all the things that we, you know, tell people who haven't met Jews before. Um, so that was really cool. Um, I don't know offhand where I have that target picture, unfortunately, with her in it, um, but it's better that way than you guys can't uh, steal pictures of Olympians. Um, now, getting back to my synagogue for just the last one more minute before I take questions, um, you know, our synagogue has, like I said, 34 acres, and I was going to wanting, I wanted to put archery in, I knew I wanted to do it. I spoke with a couple families from our day school, and I said, I really think this could be valuable. And they said, we really think it's a great idea too. Um, and they helped me put in um, an archery um, whole setup there. Um, basically what ended up happening is um, I, here, I will show you one more thing. This is some of my practice recently at my coach's house. Um, right, it's beautiful, we're on his lawn. And this, and those are the pictures I didn't get to replace yet, but this one shows you what this young girl is doing. She's standing at these hay bales that were put in, in the backyard of my synagogue. There's a safety curtain right behind it. Um, and what it's doing is it's helping to make sure that the arrows don't go anywhere we don't want them to go. Um, but I did a two week archery elective for one of our local um, equivalent of a JCC for their summer camp this past summer, teaching these kids some of my Jewish values stuff. Like I said, I did about a 10 person archery training for Ramah um, back before the summer started. And, you know, it's really, for me, so rewarding is to be able to kind of put these two things together. I never would have thought 
that when I started doing archery 12 hours a week in college and people thought I was nuts, and this was nothing that had anything to do with anything I'd ever done before, that I would still this many years later, you know, that was 2007, um, this many years later, still be doing this kind of work. Um, and I think it'd be part of what I do. You know, I did an archery elective for my religious school last year. Um, when everybody was stuck doing religious school online, I said, okay, for the last four weeks of the year, we're going to bring people back to the building and we'll go outside. And we had people doing art and people doing gardening and people doing archery. Um, I don't know anywhere else that people can say they went to religious school and they got to shoot arrows. Um, so I'll take it as a win. I really appreciate the ability to be here with you guys. Thank you to all the people from Men's Club who brought me on. And then uh, for those of you who are here to be able to spend some time with me tonight. Not sure who's uh, fielding. All right, but... great. Well, that was, that was uh, fantastic. So we do have um, several questions in the chat. So let's do a couple of things. First, I'm going to take you off spotlight. Well, that didn't work. Okay. It does. Uh, you just have to go back to gallery view. I don't know. Uh, What's wrong? Okay, whatever. We'll figure it out. So let's see. Um, oh, so, <laughs> so the first comment someone wants to know, they have archery in the basement of their house. I'm very impressed. <laughs> so uh, I tried doing archery. Um, I tried to practice without letting go and accidentally shot a hole about this long in the wall of my apartment in New York City. Never again. I filled it with a uh, Q-tip and some whiteout over it. <laughs> no one else ever knew except for all of you. Um, but my coach had said, oh, yeah, just, you know, pull it back and then relax. Just don't let it go. Yeah, it flips. That's not how that works. It's not so easy to just not let it go. Okay, so um, from the beginning of your presentation, you showed the uh, mascot from Brandeis. Yeah. One of our uh, listeners or participants and it wants to know how come the mascots, both of them, are left-handed archers. Um, so let me go back to that slide for a second, and let me see. Um, so the way that he drew it for them to be left-handed is most likely just for the angle of the shirt the direction they wanted it to go on um it's also possible that it happened to be the way he drew it the first time around and then that was it um but i think actually let me see that that's not 100 percent true because the one on the second slide let's see i'll show you in a second so let's go back here. Oh, no, you're right. They're all like that. I don't know. That's just how I drew it. <laughs> um, and then, then the, what's funny is that the one that we have, um, that's the one I showed you last, that's the one that's inverted. Um, the black and bluish one, um, that one is right-handed. Um, but those are not such crazy uh, important things. What's funny about um, right and left-handed is that I'm actually left-handed in real life, but I am right eye dominant, which means that my right eye is stronger than my left. Everybody who is anybody, most people in the world have a dominant eye. Uh, and if you've never been tested, find me after this presentation and I'll tell you how to do it. But uh, my coach said, we're going to do um, an eye test before everybody starts shooting for the first time. And based on what your eyes say is how you're going to shoot. So even though I'm left-handed, I've been shooting archery right-handed for my entire archery career. And that's just how I do it. Um, because that's how my eyes are. So uh, you're going to the next Maccabee, Maccabee Games and those are this yeah. summer? They are this summer. I am actually the chair of the U.S. team, which means that instead of just deciding if I'm good enough, now I have to decide if everybody else is good enough. So there are now eight of us, and I decided that they're all good enough. To be honest, they're probably all better than I am, but we'll see how it goes. I didn't give up my own spot. Uh, I told them I'd like to still come, and they said as long as they don't have a full roster that I can still come even if I'm not as good as the rest of the team, but uh, I'm working on it. I'm improving every day. I had what they call a personal best, 
this past Sunday, where I beat my score from last month by 22 points, which out of 1,200 is not a ton of points, but it's still something. Um, That's true. Yeah, so the question, the What's the question? The question is, what are your goals? What is the so team my goals? goals? For the Maccabi what Games, one is the fact that we have a team means that we can hopefully compete in some of the team competitions, which are not just individual events. So more events than we could before. Um, we actually are planning to bring a coach, which we're really excited about, um, and also to have a little more experience at the outdoor distances. Now that I live in a place where I can actually do that, um, I will be able to start training now for outdoor distance as opposed to in March or April or May, like I did back up in New York, really April or May. Um, and my goals for myself for Israel are, um, you know, that kind of competition is different than almost any other kind of competition that I do. And I just want to continue to do what's called the personal best, right? Continuing to beat yourself, to do better than you did last time um, and to represent your country in a way that makes you proud and makes them proud. Um, so kind of those are what I'm thinking of right now. So at the Maccabee Games, are there any other clergy that you know of that is competing? Um, there are sometimes other clergy who are competing, not in archery. Um, I don't know anybody else really. I know maybe one other person who's in, one or two other people who are rabbis who do archery, but they don't even compete. They do like archery for fun, um, which is still a valuable thing, but is different than what I do. Um, there are clergy in other sports. I don't know offhand which ones. And then I'm actually also serving as one of the rabbis for the team for this coming time. So I'll be one of two rabbis for the delegation as well. Interesting. So mm -hmm. uh, here's a not really good question. What age do you suggest children begin learning archery? So it really depends on what kind of equipment you have. Almost anybody can start learning if they have the right equipment that's sized for them. So at the summer camps that I work at, most often we start with at the very youngest, second or third grade but you can do archery with younger than that if you have the right size equipment. Um, there's no, you know, you have to have some hand-eye coordination. You have to be mature enough to be able to not, you know, shoot the wrong direction or hurt yourself. But I know people who start their kids really young. Um, in most of my settings, like I said, we start at second or third at the youngest. Um, but I've let kids who are younger than that try it where you sometimes have to just hold it with them. Um, and it just kind of depends. And uh, another good question, is archery expensive? Is it an expensive sport to yes. participate in? It is. Um, well, to go to competitions, you could spend 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 dollars for your registration fee, depending on what the kind of competition it is. Um, but buying the equipment and then traveling to the competition, it's really the equipment that's expensive. Um, you know, I actually just recently bought some new equipment. I have not bought new equipment since before the last Maccabi games pretty much um, and before that I have things that I haven't replaced since college you know I have one piece that I just replaced I had bought the what well, the one I just replaced from it was it's the site the thing that I look through when I'm aiming I bought that back in 2008 and I have not bought a new one since then so I just got a new one now and my coach said you've earned it right <laughs> you've been using this other one for how many years now you can get a new one um, and then what's really cool is that by working with this coach, he has some sponsorship deals for his athletes with certain companies. And so I got uh, a couple of new pieces of equipment that were just about half off because of his association with them. Um, and so that was exciting. I was able to sort of save some of the money for that. But yeah, my bow, I bought a new set of arrows and they were a couple hundred dollars for just 12 of them. Um, I The new site that I got was... I want to say between two and three hundred dollars. The new stabilizer bars that I just got could have been eight hundred, but because they were like about half off, they were a little over four. Um, I bought new limbs when I was at the outdoor competition I was at back in August from another girl who had barely used them. They should have cost eight hundred, but she sold them to me for five fifty. Um, and those, you know, they last for as long as you can let them last if you take good care of them, but it's expensive. Excellent. So I'm not sure why this New Jersey guy 
wants you to know this, but he was really excited to hear you mention Gainesville and Newberry. So clearly, yeah, Elliot that went is to where, school uh, in Florida. Where UF is, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So a um, couple of, a uh, few more good questions here. Here he goes, look at him, he's carrying on. Um, so kind of opposite, oh, before I ask you those two questions, um, our media press president wants to know if you know Ite Shani. Yeah, so Itai Shani, um, I don't know him. I did follow him while he was in Israel last, while he was in Tokyo last summer. I do know his coach who went to Tokyo with him. Um, his coach is one of the Israeli archers who's helping to coordinate things on the Maccabi game side in Israel. And his mother was the person who I coordinated with last time around because she was organizing the Israel side of things for the Maccabi games back four and a half years ago. Um, and so I don't know Itai, I might meet him when I go this summer, who knows if he'll be around or not, but his coach, Guy Maskin, um, I do know. Guy wasn't in Israel last time around because he was in Nimes competing there during the Maccabi games at another world archery competition. Um, but his mother, um, Ella was the organizer from the Israeli side last time around. So uh, a few more questions and then I have one for you and then we'll wrap sure. up. So um, have you ever experienced anti-Semitism in your archery practice or competition? Yeah, so I haven't. I don't know if I just got lucky because I was in New York where there's a lot of Jews. Um, up in Massachusetts, there are not as many, but people really didn't say anything to me about it. Most of the time, I would get people who were impressed by the fact that I was shooting that double tournament. So that was the most of the time where it would come up was on a Sunday when I was shooting back-to-back -back parts of a tournament and they had all been there on Saturday. And I would explain, I was not here yesterday. It's you know, the Jewish Sabbath, and then they would just say, wow, I can't believe you're shooting so many arrows in one day. So it really never turned into anything negative, thank God. Um, I can't tell you that no one has experienced anti-Semitism in an archery setting, but I've been fortunate not to. Great. So um, as the congregational rabbi, how does your shul uh, perceive your so the question is, how does your congregational community see your commitment to archery as something that enhances your rabbit? So how do you tie it all in, I guess, is the question. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think more recently, now that we have it in the backyard, and I'm going to hopefully start using it with our kids and with various clubs on the you know, property and parts of our community, you know, the sisterhood has said they want to do stuff. We're hoping to get some lights out there so we can do it at nighttime too. Um, so I think that the, um, you know, using it with my community is one side of it. And they think that that is a benefit to the community. But I think having a hobby that's totally separate and also being part of the Maccabi games is not, you know, nothing, right? People, at least I hope in my community um, are excited for that aspect of it. There's some people on here from my synagogue so we could always ask them how they feel about it. Um, but I have had people who've said, you know, oh, Rabbi, just send me the link for your, you know, your fundraising that you're doing, and I'll happily make a donation. You know, as a congregational rabbi, I have not sent out an email from my work email to my congregants asking them for donations, because for me and our executive director, we agreed that that was not something I would do, but I posted it on Facebook, and if they're friends with me on Facebook, you know, we socialize outside of the synagogue, or if they see me, um, I'm happy to take, you know, donations from them, but I can't compete with synagogue fundraising. Um, but, you know, I think what's, what I was remembering today is that back when I first thought about doing it four and a half, five years ago, I sent an email to the dean and the assistant dean and I said, is this something that's going to ruin my prospects of getting a job, doing the Maccabi games, you know, kind of right before I have to move somewhere? Because I knew that it was going to be that I couldn't start a job when the people might have wanted me to start a job. And I said to them, is this something that you think is going to be a problem? And they said, you know, it happens sometimes that people just tell the jobs they're interviewing for that they have a commitment. They can't start until, you know, July 31st instead of July 15th, and the synagogues will figure it out. Um, and that's really what happened. Uh, and the synagogue has been supportive when I've gone away to a competition. Um, I did have to miss a bar mitzvah back in August to be able to go to that competition, um, the outdoor nationals. I wasn't shooting on Saturday, but I was not able to drive all the way home from Virginia to Jacksonville before Shabbat. I drove most of the way. I slept at a hotel and spent Shabbat by myself there just relaxing. And then the next morning 
was the first day of religious school, which I run in our synagogue. So I drove back the rest of the drive on Saturday night, went to sleep, got up in the morning and did my thing. But, you know, you miss a bar mitzvah here and there. It happens for lots of things. And no one said anything about the fact that I was at a competition. I think for the most part, they think it's pretty cool. At least I hope they do. So one of our other media past presidents that happens to live in Florida, you can use him as a target, by the way. His name's okay. Alan. And he wants to know, you know, <laughs> Rosh Hashanah, Apples and Honey, William Tell. He's trying to be funny. Yes. He is funny. Oh, my, my dad used to call me Wilhelmina Tell. Um, and I have actually shot an apple, but not on anybody's head. Uh, I have shot a, uh, a Nalgene bottle. You know, those bottles are supposed to be indestructible. I shot an arrow through one of those. It did get stuck. I don't recommend it. It was not so good for my arrow. Who cares about the water bottle? The water bottle can be broken, but I don't want to move my arrows. I told you arrows are expensive. Um, I have shot lots of different things. Um, I would probably not put an arrow on the top of my students' heads, but I would put them on top of a target. Um, and if someone wanted me to shoot an apple, I'm happy to do it. Um, you know, it kind of depends how far away you go. But oh, yes, I'm sure it could be a good fundraiser. Um, yeah, and speaking of yeah. funds, I do need to raise some. So uh, we were thinking that um, that, that would be a really good fundraiser for FJMC. We have these uh, retreats and conventions. We'll invite you. We'll select okay. people. And you can practice <laughs> and actually show us how it's really done now that you've sure. watched you on the webinar. But anyway, yes. but my, um, my final question was what I was most interested in, um, the skill set. Do you need it? I'm not very coordinated, so I probably am out of the running, and that's being polite as my wife is listening to this, right? Do you need a certain skill set to do archery? Because I've never really thought about it, to be honest, until I came across you. Um, I don't know. I mean, I kind of wonder sometimes if I'm actually good at it or if I like have decided that I want to be good, so I just keep practicing and keep practicing and get better. Um, you know, is it that some people are just really good at it and some people aren't, or is it just the more you practice and the more you learn, the better you're able to be at it? Um, and I don't have an answer for you on that. I haven't figured out what the way that it goes is. Is it one or the other? Is it, you know, like they say, nature or nurture? Is it practicing or is it that you are happen to be skilled at something? I think it's really more about consistency, doing something over and over again, the exact same way. So there is some hand-eye coordination that's required, but also being able to commit yourself to working on it, to doing the same thing over and over. Um, I now have certain books that I'm reading because my coach recommended that I learn about the shot process. So even though I can't practice archery on Shabbat, I do read my archery book on Shabbat and I learn about the various steps of my shot process. Um, there's a lot of mental game to it. So he's got me a, a couple of books that I wanted, he wanted me to get that have to do with, you know, keeping your head in the game and not letting the tar you know, target panic is actually a thing that people have an issue with where you can shoot all day long the center of the target at practice and you get to a tournament and you can't hit the center for your life. Um, that's called target panic. And it does happen and you have to kind of get over it and hopefully that it doesn't happen to you. Yes, practicing Torah reading, yes, practice, practice. Um, I don't know, Torah reading's always been easy for me so I can't relate, but uh, <laughs> um, Torah reading is much easier than archery. Torah reading I can do at the drop of a hat. Uh, archery takes some time. But, Excellent. you know, last week before my tournament, I shot two days in the back of our synagogue and I shot one day down in Daytona. If I could shoot multiple days in a week like that, I'd be great. I usually only get to practice one day a week. So we'll see how it goes. But Excellent. gearing well, up this for was just the summer. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Really, really was. Uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, honest and truly, we've had over 25 of these uh, sports webinars over the last two years, you know, the boring sports of baseball and basketball and hockey and football never had archery before. So I think this group has a whole new appreciation of you, of, of archery. I was on your Facebook page yesterday and did make a donation. So I'll give you a little plug so that if you go on Facebook under Rabbi Shira Rosenblum, it is certainly there to support her, her team. Um, Thank you. And uh, we, um, have another unconventional sport that we're going to feature uh, very soon uh, on March 8th. If you now are happy about learning about archery, the next person you're gonna learn about is fencing. 
So we have Eli Dershowitz, um, and he is an Olympian. Uh, he grew up uh, at David Singer School, and uh, we're very excited to to feature him on March eighth. So that's our next our next sports webinar from the Federation of Jewish Men's Club. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we are the Umbrella uh, Men's Club. So if you have a men's club in your shul and your conservative synagogue, you should be affiliated with the FJMC, the Federation of Jewish Men's Club. And we've been doing this really almost now, we have been doing this for two years. Uh, and we have our first live gathering, because you guys know I can't help myself, in Los Angeles in a few weeks on March 31st through April 3rd that we're very excited about because we love Zoom, but we can't wait to get together. So, um, and it's not too nobody late really to Nobody really loves Zoom. Nobody loves Zoom, right? But it, it served a great purpose. And so we're excited about that and excited about seeing each other. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Rabbi Rosenblum. It's a great story. We really appreciate it. And uh, you never know when we could show up in your shul and ask you to uh, give us some live target practice. And we have a few people we'll bring with us. Thank you, everyone. Good. good night. Thank good. you, David Kravitz. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Danny. Good night. See you thank again. You so Take care. Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi.